Incredible things happen in solitude and silence as we lean into these moments, as we engage them, as we allow God to begin to speak to us. And not only do we find rest, and not only do we need find rest, we also need rest to engage the journey. We need to be rested to be able to, to move into the empty places. We need to be rested to be able to receive from God. And I love how, for so many people, as I have been uh, getting texts and conversations and emails, just about how they are experiencing this in their lives right now, and, and the struggle. And I want to encourage you that wherever you are in this journey, just to continue. Just to continue moving in it. Because it's not, you do this, and you do this, and you do this. Like for different people, they're still just finding rest, which is so good. There's some people, and I've had a couple of conversations this week, that, yeah, I'm finding the empty places. I don't like them. Be encouraged that you don't sit in that empty place until it's all resolved, that in your time of solitude, and, be, and, and guard the time and make it a set time, whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or whatever it is, that when those 20 minutes are up or whatever, that you have the confidence to move on knowing that when you come back, maybe once again, Father will take you to that place of emptiness. But there's this beautiful thing that happens, and Elijah shows us this, where you have this place where God continues to work, and even while he's working, he will give you guidance and ask you to begin to engage. I find it interesting that there, in this story, that there's a couple of things that actually encourage me. If you have your Bibles, uh, just turn to First Kings, 9, First Kings chapter 19, and we're carrying on from uh, verse 13. And uh, and in this, there's a couple of things that encourage me here that I find really interesting, and and actually, this story helps me as I think about solitude and silence. It is interesting to me, first of all, that Elijah, when you read this, he never asked for guidance. So many times for, self, for us to engage solitude and silence, that's a reason that we're coming, because we're seeking guidance, we're asking God to reveal himself, to speak to us, to help us maybe with a situation or a circumstance that just feels overwhelming. And the very reason we're there is to receive guidance, but for Elijah, he never... He never asked for it. I'm going to read, uh, just starting in verse 13, when Elijah heard it, this is what we looked at last week, when Elijah heard it, a gentle whisper, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. <coughs> then the Lord said to him, and this is what I love, go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus, and when you get there, anoint Haziel king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu, Jehu will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Haziel, and Elisha will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Jehu. Yet I, God says, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose <coughs> knees have not bowed to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. And here in this moment, God brings uh, guidance to Elijah. He, hadn't, he isn't asking for it. And in this moment of solitude and silence, where he has removed himself from the noise, where he has removed himself from the busyness, where he has removed himself out of desperation and encounters God, God begins to speak to him and bring next steps in this place where he's quiet. 
parents with children, I think you can identify this. Have you ever been there uh, where your kids just struggle and struggle and struggle, and it's only when they calm down that they'll actually listen to you? Right? I'm waiting for it, personally. <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's interesting as, their, as your kids age and as they, it's, it's, and I experience, I think we all experience, it's amazing how wise our parents are the older we get. Mm. But it's that image that I see here that in this moment where Elijah had just, he's, he's done struggling, now God speaks. The other thing I find interesting here is that when this question came to him, when this question came what are you doing here, Elijah? The same question. And Elijah gives the same response, identical. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. The good, the bad, the ugly. I am the only one left now, and they are trying to kill me too. God has shown up. God has brought his presence to him in this gentle whisper and Elijah is still stuck. This disillusionment, this area of brokenness where he was just like, I'm all alone, I'm all alone, I'm all alone. That's not fixed yet. And what I love about this is not only does God bring guidance, he isn't waiting until Elijah gets everything fixed before he says, okay, I've got something for you to do. I love that about God, and I love that He, in this moment, says, <laughs> Okay, take you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I have something for you to do. I love the grace that I see here. Elijah's core issue, his ugliness, as it were, was not a deterrent for God to use him. God simply gave him next steps gave him assignments that a prophet should be doing, gave him the rest that he needed, gave him the encounter that he needed, and then out of that said, okay, let's go. God accepted him as he was and ministered to him in all that he was. And then Elijah moves from there. And I love how at the end of the story, where Elijah was, was getting ready to go, and then God says, oh, by the way, you're not alone. I want you to go, but by the way, you're not alone. There's 7,000 who have not bowed to Baal or kissed his mouth. You're not alone, Elijah. And God says, okay, this is what you're going to do. And here's the truth that you need to counter the lie that you're believing. God spoke to his disillusionment and replaced the lie with truth. He addressed the area of woundedness. But he had given him his assignment. He had brought guidance first. Sometimes, often actually, I have personally experienced this where you will receive or I'll receive guidance, be asked to move in a certain direction, move in the purpose that God calls me to, calls you to, moves in the calling that we have. Well, the biggest needs that I'm facing, the biggest areas of brokenness, the emptiness, the desert, whatever it is, still isn't resolved. And it's amazing to me how when you begin to obey, how when you begin to move in the guidance that God's bringing, and you actually go and engage, how the very thing you need gets restored while you're serving, while you're obeying, while you're moving in the direction that God needs you to. So often I think that the healing that we look for in our emptiness actually comes as we engage in what God's calling us to. Sometimes the healing that we look for in our emptiness, sometimes the, the heartache, the grieving, or whatever it is that we are encountering in isolation will never be dealt with. 
that it takes community, that it takes being obedient to God's voice and pressing in to the things that God's calling us to. Some of you, I've heard this this week. Steve, that was Elijah. He was a prophet. He was a great man of God. Of course God's going to speak to him audibly. God does not guide me like that. God does not speak to me audibly. And I'm like, okay, audibly, all right. I've had moments where I believe it was audible. You just know. But I don't, I don't think for a moment that God doesn't speak. You see, there's a, I love how James says this in James 5, and talking about Elijah, and we're actually, when we talk about devoted to prayer, we're actually coming back to this. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. I don't want us, when we think about listening to God and hearing His voice and, and looking for guidance, I don't want us to go, well, I'm not a prophet. I'm not Elijah. Elijah was a person. He was a human being. Just like you. Just like me. And he heard God's voice. And I want to remind us of the things that we know that so often, and I think of uh, just even our meeting this week, and John Torrance, I didn't ask for permission to share this, but I'm going to. We, in our time together as a team, we talked about, look, at where, where do we see God at work? Where, where do we, what are the stories of God working in us and around us? And John shared that when it came to solitude and silence, that God speaks to him through Scripture. And it was like he was apologizing for that. And I was just, in that moment, I'm like, I don't know, if that's how God speaks to you, then you need to pay attention to Scripture. Because for each one of us, it's different. God will speak to us through Scripture. God will speak to us through people, through community, through those that are safe, through those that are close to us, through the people that are wise. But we also need to remember that God will speak to us through His Holy Spirit as well. I think it's so important for us to remember that we, in solitude and silence, that, as, that we have to come to this place where we learn to discern God's guidance, where we learn to discern the voice of God. We need to remember that the Holy Spirit actually is at work in our lives, that He will speak to us, and that His guidance, you know, it's, it's important for us to remember that he is given to us for this very reason. Jesus said this, he said, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. I love this because then I want you to pay attention that when certain decisions or circumstances that we are going through, that we are walking through, whether it's, again, the empty places or stuff that's heavy, the Holy Spirit guides us into truth. And I love this promise that he will, that I have much more to say to you, but more than you can bear now. Have you ever been in that place where it's more, you feel that it's more than you can bear? So often, and this is what happens as we pursue, as we grow in solitude and silence, as we learn to hear God's voice, it feels like it is more than we can bear. But Holy Spirit only brings what we can. And can we have confidence in that? Can we have peace in that? That even though this feels like too much, to trust that I will get the truth that I need for this moment and not more than I can bear, not more than I can handle. I think in solitude and silence, as we grow and develop in this practice, as we grow and develop in this discipline in our lives, we need to learn to discern God's voice. We need to learn to discern what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. And it takes time. 
It takes quiet. It takes that silence of quietening all the noise that tries to get our attention. I talked about this last week, and I think one of the things that helps us in, in growing in this is just a few practical things. Like, how do I grow? I had somebody ask me this, this week, how do I grow? How do I learn to discern God's voice? And the simple practice that I talked about last week, and I, I forget which one of the... Oh, I should have written this down. If someone, if this jumps to mind, let me know. There was a, one of these like, monks who, this was his practice. And I, and I do this often. It's, I sit and I go, okay, Holy Spirit, where did I see God's presence yesterday? Where did I see God's presence? Where did I see God move? Just you and me talking. And you start to look at the things that you did and the things you were engaged in, the words that you said, the good words, the not-so-good words, the <laughs> movements, the, the good movements, the not-so-good movements. And it's amazing what you hear. Where did I miss you? Where did I see God's presence yesterday? Where did I miss God's presence? That's a bigger question, yes. Where did I miss God's presence? You know, it's, in, it's so interesting for us to learn how to do whatever it takes for us to learn, to listen, to learn to discern God's voice. The thing that, one other thing that I was brought to memory this morning was how St. Ignatius talks about this, about learning to discern God's voice. He uses two words in this practice. He, the words are consultation and desolation. Consultation and desolation. For him, he would engage his life and say, okay, when I'm looking for guidance, when I'm trying to discern what God's, guidance is for this, or what the Holy Spirit is saying for this, does this, whatever it is, console? Does it bring together? Does it bring peace? Is there a consultation, a consolation, rather, with me and God where life comes, where life is breathed in, where we experience love for God and others? Do I see that happening with this choice? Or do I see desolation? Which of the two is moving me? Which, is, If I follow this, do I see a, a consultation? Or if I'm following this, do I see a desolation? Two powerful images of just pra that he used that I think is so practical for us when we are looking for guidance. To pause and say, what is this going to breathe? Is it going to breathe life? Or is it going to breathe death? Where did I see God's presence? Where did I miss God's presence? This whole area of guidance is so pivotal in our solitude and silence because it will come. And it is much needed. Because, because it was not God's desire that Elijah stay in solitude. And it's not God's desire that we stay in solitude, either. There is this deep thing that happens where, and I, how many people have experienced these moments of solitude and silence, and you just want to stay there? <laughs> right? I see the hands. I'm like, I don't want to go out there. This is so good. Safe. This is safe. This breathes life. And I'm not going to move from this. 
There is a danger in this that I need us to draw that I need to draw our attentions to that because I get it. I get it. We go to the solitude. It's like the mountaintop experience. And you just want to stay there. But what happens to those around you if you refuse to engage community? If you, if you refuse to bring what God's doing in you to the world around you? God wouldn't let Elijah stay in solitude. Elijah, I got a job for you. There are some very important things that you need to do. And look at what God, I mean, he, Elisha was anointed. And the role that Elisha played in the nation. We have no idea what hangs in the balance in our choices of to engage community or not out of our solitude and silence. I think it's important for us to remember that we have been instructed to go. Matthew 28. Then, the, then verse uh, 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain. I didn't see that before, until this morning. To the mountain, where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw them, when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Go. Not stay. Therefore, don't, you know, he didn't say, therefore, stay here where we've had this worship experience. Stay here on the mountaintop where it's just been you and I. No. Because of this, you go now. You go and cause people that word make. We've talked about that before. It's not force. It's not in I'm going to make you a disciple. No, no, no. Go and live your life in such a way that it causes people to want what you have and teach what I've taught. <laughs> See, the thing is, we love the mountaintop experiences. We love those moments where it's just him and I where the clarity... All I'm not going to stir it up this week. All the sediment has settled. And now we see. And these are such precious moments that we don't want to leave. But we are called to go. It is interesting to me that, you know, Elijah completely spent dangerously tired, nothing to give. He finds rest, strength, and then he's commissioned to go and give out of what he has received. Something about the process of having our emptiness filled in solitude eventually does enable us to engage with those around us on the basis of fullness rather than need. That's the beauty of silence and solitude. Where we can engage in community because of the fullness we have, not because we're engaging out of need, not because we're engaging out of compulsion, not because we're engaging out of I ought to and I should. You engage in community from a fullness where there's love and compassion. In her book, Ruth Barton wrote something about engaging community that I've been experiencing but couldn't really put into words. A few people this summer, I remember a conversation I had with one individual and, and they are, were aware of my journey and they said, so how are things going for you? And I said, I have a hard time explaining this. I said, but it's like 
The busyness of life has not changed. If anything, it's gotten busier. But because of practices of solitude and silence, there's a peace here. And it feels like I'm moving slowly and while well, everything else is not moving slowly. And then in her book I read this, and it explains what I just said a whole lot better. I had not moved beyond solitude, rather by God's grace brought the quietness of my solitude right into the present moment. The quietness of solitude and silence was becoming an, inter, an inner condition within which I was able to recognize and respond to the stirrings, the voice, the very presence of God himself. And it's amazing what happens in this moment that you begin, that the solitude and silence doesn't leave you as you engage community. And it's amazing when you grow in this and see it happening. And I have by no means, I have, like, when I think about this journey for me, I mean, some, I have a, a dream of doing a day of solitude and silence. A long way from that right now. But what I'm seeing it change me, how it's affecting me, is that before, my engagement in community was really draining, and the drain was fast. Now, because of solitude and silence, that doesn't leave. It is now present in community. And it's amazing what comes out. It's amazing how the fullness that you receive is now given to others and meets them where they are. Your homework this week is this. Uh, Kevin, could you help with this? And Ange, or Terry, sure. This is your homework this week. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to, when it comes to receiving guidance, reflect on what was shared by St. Ignatius. One of the ways to receive guidance is to pay attention to what brings consolation and what brings desolation. In the past few days, when were you most grateful? When were you able to give and receive love? When were you, when were you least able to be grateful? When were you least able to give and receive love? When it comes to community, ask God to show you when or where the quality of your presence with others seemed different. Are you experiencing a shift in how solitude and silence is changing how you engage community? Who is God asking you to engage with, to breathe life into? Who is God asking you to engage with, to breathe life into? As I reflect, I just want to share, I wrote this, this yesterday morning. As we wrap up this part of All In, as we wrap up Solitude and Silence, it's not something that is finished. It's a journey that I, I hope is a gathering that we're all entering. As I reflect on the journey of solitude and silence over the past 18 months, so much has changed. I don't measure productivity the same anymore. Being productive, successful for me now, is not measured by external metrics, isn't measured or validated by those around me. It is measured and validated by the audience of one. For me, I measure success now by whether or not I'm moving in and out of these rhythms of engagement and rest, solitude and community. Combination of silence and God's word needed so that the moments with God and others are marked by love, compassion, marked by discernment and wisdom. Success, success is knowing that I need to guard my times of solitude and silence so that the waters of my soul stay clear. So that busyness, the noise of this world, doesn't become my focus anymore. Solitude and silence for me means, and the success is having clarity. Clarity enough to discern what God would have in this moment and the next. 
through solitude and silence, seeing God restore, heal, redeem, and transform me from the inside out in the empty places of my life. I feel like I'm only scratching the surface, but these rhythms are now non-negotiables for me. For there is nothing that fills like the love that God is. There is nothing that transforms like the presence that is God. There is nothing else that produces what the silence of God produces within the human soul. For there is nothing that fills like the love that God is, that is God. There is nothing that transforms like the presence that is, that is God. There is nothing else that, a, that produces what the silence of God produces within the human soul.
possessions and gave to anyone who had need. That's the passage that, that when Steve and I were talking about where we needed to go this fall, we said, you know, we really need to dig into that. And as we were talking about it, we thought, we've been through this so many times over our lifetimes. We've looked at that passage and and if you enter into a discussion about that, looking at the tasks, uh, four things they committed themselves to and try to build yourself up by committing to those things, thinking that those things will build your relationship with Christ, we've completely missed the point. It really is all about relationship. There's a passage in Ephesians that talks about, um, it's right, right in the middle of a passage on marriage, and it's Ephesians 5. And as Paul is writing about what marriage is supposed to look like, it, it, there's this, there's this like really obscure passage right in the middle of this. Verse 31, it says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. <laughs> As Paul is writing this, he's writing about marriage, and he's talking about how marriage should function, and then he says, okay, really marriage isn't about marriage. Marriage, a healthy marriage, is about helping you to understand what Christ desires to have in a relationship with you. Jen and I celebrated our 30th anniversary on 
Monday. Congratulations. Thank you. And um, if the success of our marriage was based on me, I'm pretty sure I could mess it up before we left this building today. So I'm not talking about being a success, but what I want to talk about a little bit is what I've learned in those 30 years. And the interesting thing with these 30 years is that 30 years ago on Monday, there had been a period of time that had built up to where Jen and I actually got married. And it, and it didn't just start 30 years ago. There was a period of time where we actually fell in love and where we were in relationship. But 30 years ago, we made a decision and a commitment to share everything. And so we shared an address 30 years ago. We shared a bed, which was fantastic. We, we shared food. We shared rent. We shared everything. All of a sudden, it wasn't about two individuals. It was about a life shared in every aspect. And if we approach our relationship with Christ based on relationship first and sharing things, it's not then about tasks. Because everything that we accomplish in marriage in terms of tasks, <laughs> you can pay for. But it's not driven on relationship. And if you approach your relationship with Christ with a list of tasks, thinking that the tasks are what matter, you will never experience what Christ has for you and you will never have success in that relationship. You see, for the past 30 years, um, we have done everything together. I like eating, and for the past 30 years, whenever we are together, we have supper together, and I will wait for her, or she will wait for me, because it's really not about eating, it's about an opportunity to share in relationship. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I don't like exercise, but I love walking with Jen around town in the evenings. And I don't have to be reminded that we haven't walked for a week because I miss it. I'm drawn to it. I'm drawn to those activities because it comes out of relationship. It's not a task anymore that we're accomplishing things together. And so as we move into rules for a functioning church, rules that build us up together when we look at the tasks of the apostles' teaching and prayer and fellowship and giving. We can't look at those things as tasks. We look at those things as opportunities to build our relationship with Christ. And so when we move into this section, um, when we were talking about this, I said, Steve, we can't just start with tasks. We gotta start with relationship, and Steve said, I'll do a week on solitude and silence, and here we are five weeks later, because it matters. Don't enter into where we're headed, thinking that it's all about the task. Enter in out of the relationship that we are in already, and growing. I just wanna pray for us. Father, as we move into understanding what it looks like to live in a healthy relationship with you. I pray that we would not be looking for checklists and we wouldn't be asking you for anything. We wouldn't be looking into your teachings thinking about how this is going to pay off for us. And we wouldn't be looking into giving, asking how am I going to get my money back but we would be looking into loving you. That we would be looking into building our relationship with you. 
by doing life together. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you close it with the chorus? And then we'll go. I just want you and nothing else.